Welcome everyone to the final SITSITE Oz Online. Uh, once again, we have a jam-packed session this evening, but this time we're exploring innovation in citizen science. My name is Patrick Teggett, and I am one of the Australian Citizen Science Association's Management Committee members. Tonight, I am also joined by my co-host, Max Newlands, who is also on the Management Committee. Before I kick into things, I just thought I'd take the opportunity to do a, uh, acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we are all digitally joining from this evening. I'm joining from Barrow in New South Wales, which is the land of the Gundagara people. I'd also like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and extend these respects to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who are joining this evening and extend it even further to any in the, uh, traditional custodians or owners of the land joining from regions across the globe that aren't just within Australia. And if you are, thank you very much for joining SIPSITE Oz online tonight. So as I mentioned, this is the final one of the series. SIPSITE Oz online has been running right throughout October on every Wednesday of the month, but it would not have nearly been as successful as it has been without our sponsors. And so, we were really gracious to have these sponsors that were able to help with the running of SITSITE Oz Online. So firstly, there was the Thea Murphy Initiative. And through this initiative, the Australian Academy of Sciences is able to conduct up to four activities and events annually to support Australia's early and mid-career researcher community. And the purpose of these activities is to provide tangible benefits to the early and mid-career researchers to support their careers and ultimately further scientific discovery. We were also sponsored by the Mindaroo Foundation through their Fire and Flood Resilience Initiative. And so this foundation, for those who don't know, is a modern philanthropic organisation that takes on tough and persistent issues with the potential to drive massive change. The foundation is independent, forward thinking and seeks effective and scalable solutions. We were also sponsored by the Environment Institute. And this institute brings together leading researcher groups at the University of Adelaide in the fields of science, engineering and economics relating to the management and use of natural resources and infrastructure. And finally, we were sponsored by the Australian Museum. And the Australian Museum is Australia's first museum and within uh, this organisation, they do have a centre for citizen science, which has a range of different programs to enable the citizen science community generally to collect biodiversity data or to analyse it online, which is making more data available for researchers and the community alike. Due to the time constraints this evening, uh, I'm only able to give a short spiel about them, but I highly recommend checking out all of these sponsors. They're doing some wonderful things right across the country for the community and a range of different organisations. And they may have um, opportunities for your group in the short or long term. Like the previous sessions, we just have a few housekeeping items. Uh, it looks like you all already are, but we just ask that by the speakers that you remain on mute right throughout the session. And this will allow everyone to be able to hear the speakers and what they're presenting. To also help optimise your viewing tonight, um, if you can, please turn off your video. And what I mean here is just switching off either your computer's camera or your phone's camera, depending on which device you're joining in from. And this is important because there's quite a few people joining tonight and this will help restrict any lag or buffering that may occur. And so that will optimise your viewing, but also as this session will be recorded, We'll be recording it and making it available on uh, Axe's YouTube channel for you to go and check out later. But we also have our previous sessions online as well, so you can go see them there too. And I know you're all going to be anyway, but we just ask that you be respectful to other attendees and speakers online. For those that use social media, um, if you want to share your thoughts, your experiences and what you've learnt about SITSITE Oz Online, we just ask that you use the hashtag SITSITE Oz Online and use at SITSITE Oz and that way we can see what you thought about the event as well as letting others do the same. 
Last few bits of housekeeping and probably the most important one is the chat function. A lot of you may know what it is and how to use it, but just in case there's a few people online tonight, if you look towards the bottom of your Zoom window, you'll probably see a speech bubble with chat underneath it. And if you were to click on that, you'd either have a pop-up box appear or towards the right-hand side of your screen, a column appear. And this is important for two reasons. Firstly, any relevant links or resources that I refer to uh, this evening, I'll be adding them in the chat function so you, they're there and ready for you to click on when you need to. But more importantly, because uh, everyone bar the speaker should be on mute, this is how we'll be asking our presenters questions. So if you do have any questions for the presenters right throughout the evening, type it in there. And when it comes time to their question time, I'll read them out for the presenters uh, to, to answer. Another little quick tip to help optimise your viewing tonight, and you, it may already be happening, but towards the top right of your Zoom window, you'll probably be able to see either gallery view or speaker view. And you can toggle between these views just by clicking on that button and clicking on the appropriate option. I recommend sticking to the speaker view. And the reason behind that is you'll still be able to see the slides and what they're talking to. But more importantly, rather than having a gallery of uh, switched off videos, you'll just be able to see the speaker's video. So you'll have a more intimate um, experience seeing them speak and watching them work through their slides. And finally, like the previous sessions, we do have some prizes this evening. We are doing it a little bit differently uh, to the previous sessions. And so after the second speaker, we will have a mid session break. And that's when I'll pass it over to my co-host, Max, and she'll be introducing the online tool Slido and how we'll be using that to determine who our prize winners are this evening. Now onto the fun stuff, innovation in citizen science. For me, citizen science in its very essence is innovative. Innovation and citizen science go hand in hand. And they've been able to create a lot of innovative ideas and ways to answer research questions, ways to collect data, such as online tools or apps. But I've also enjoyed the way that it's been innovative in the way that it's enabled different communication channels and the way that the community can engage with the researcher and the researcher can engage with the community alike. But don't just take my word for it. Tonight we have six fantastic speakers who will be presenting this evening. Firstly, we'll have Iela, who is a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Sydney, and as well as a science communication researcher. She'll be followed by Michelle, who's the project director for OSMAP at the Total Environmental Centre. We also have Jasmine online, and Jasmine is a research fellow at the University of Adelaide's Environment Institute. And she's bringing some additional guest speakers with her this evening. We have Wendy, who's from the iBandy project, and also Rosalie and Robert from the Wild Orchid Watch project. So as I mentioned, jam-packed session with a lot of fantastic speakers, but that's enough for me. I will pass it over to Yala uh, to take you through the first presentation. Thank you, Yala. Thank you, Patrick. I'm just gonna share my screen. Okay, so hopefully you can see my screen now. Yep. Excellent. Uh, so thank you very much and thanks Patrick for organizing this really incredible uh, booking session. Uh, today I'm gonna talk about innovation in citizen science in the Breaking Good Project. Um, so as many of us um, probably know, citizen science has grown exponentially over the past um, 10 years or so. And according to Rick Bonney, who is a dominant figure in the citizen science space, this is because of the richness, scope, and value of this expanding field. So that is to say, citizen scientists are involved in so many different activities, um, the different tasks that they are um, uh, taking part in, um, the different ideas and the different issues that citizen science tackles, uh, whether it's science uh, focused, um, 
issues or human focused issues, uh, whether the science uh, scientific questions are raised by scientists or perhaps by communities. But when we look at the scientific fields that are represented in citizen science, we actually see that there are a few um, fields that are do more dominant in citizen science. So this is some data from a survey um, I conducted um, earlier um, or late last year. And we can see here that in Australia, the majority of the citizen science projects are in ecological projects. So that's different biodiversity uh, projects, environmental sciences. So that's looking at different um, hazards, um, environmental hazards and biology. Um, and this is not surprising. This is data that we actually really know um, from looking at the citizen science uh, landscape in the global citizen science. Um, and we can see here that the chemistry and physics and public health is really underrepresented. And that is what um, global citizen science, unfortunately, uh, is the case as well. When we think of chemistry in particular, this is even more enhanced. And that is actually quite shocking when you think about it, because chemistry is really around us in everything that we do, whether it's in the air that we breathe or in the water that we drink or in the medicines that we all sometimes need to take. And while there are a lot of citizen science projects that are focused on um, uh, air quality and water, uh, water quality monitoring, they're mostly focused um, on their environmental aspects and pollution aspects and not so much on the chemistry aspects. And well, that is why I'm very happy today to present Breaking Good, which is a chemistry-based citizen science project um, that is also involved in public health. Now, Breaking Good was initiated by Associate Professor Alice Motion, who is also joining us today. And also, happy birthday, Alice. Um, Breaking Good uh, empowers members of the public uh, to be active researchers in, pub in projects that improve public health. And today, it has two different aspects. One is a lab-based project in which um, students, university and uh, high school students engage in lab-based molecule synthesis. And then there's an online project, which is called Essential Medicines, in which people investigate some of the information on medicines that, and their accessibility. And Breaking Good focuses on increasing accessibility to essential medicines. And essential medicines are defined by the World Health Organizations as those medicines that satisfy the priority healthcare needs of the population. And these medicines should be available at all times in adequate amounts and affordable prices, in appropriate dosages and assured quality and with adequate information. So these are a lot of A's and together, we can say that these medicines should be accessible. But unfortunately, there are a lot of barriers to the access to essential medicines. And this can be related to physical distance to people that um, reside in places where they don't have access to public care, to public, to public care. Uh, it could be related to the market incentive. That's when there are few patients, uh, but high manufacturing costs. That is also related to price hikes, which are sudden increases in the prices of medicines. Uh, they're often um, due to low profit margins and indeed different societal challenges like public and political influences. Now you can see here a picture of a drug called hydroxychloroquine. Now many of you um, might've heard of this um, medicine because it has been in the media re recently. Well, it actually has been around for quite a while and it was first patented in 1955, but it has recently been suggested as a medicine that could treat COVID-19. Now, unfortunately, the science actually says that this is not the case and hydroxychloroquine is not effective in treating COVID, but this has not stopped the huge surge in the sales. And this is problematic because many people rely on hydroxychloroquine uh, to treat uh, different autoimmune conditions. And this could cause a problem in the supply of this medicines to people that actually need it. And so while this is just one example, there are many examples of barriers to access to essential medicines. And the truth is we really don't know 
the extent of this problem. And I think that maybe is the biggest problem that we have, that there is no transparency and information sharing in regard to the accessibility of essential medicines. And when this is lacking and when there is no mutual learning, then we can really don't have a lot of opportunities to negotiate the distribution of these medicines and the pricing of them. And so that is one thing that we are really interested um, in looking into in Breaking Good. And so as I said, Breaking Good has two different aspects, the lab-based um, project and the online project. And so until recently, Break, participating in Breaking Good was limited to schools and to university students. And what they did was engage in molecule synthesis as part of their um, studies of chemistry and as part of their lab instruction, they would conduct, they, or they are conducting synthesis of different molecules, um, both reproducing uh, existing medicines and creation of new molecules for different diseases. And so in the picture up here on the right, you can actually see students from Sydney Grammar School that participated in um, Breaking Good. And they set out to reproduce an antiparasitic medicine called Daraprim. Now this medicine was price hiked overnight by hundredfold or more. Um, and these students, after a lot of work and determination, were able to re reproduce this medicine for a fraction of the actual price. And so this is an example for how much people that do, are not scientists and do not have um, the vast scientific qualifications uh, that scientists may have, but they are still able to create an impact and to, um, um, and to um, progress um, these ideas. But for one problem with the breaking good uh, in the labs is that it's limited to labs. And so people that don't have these fancy facilities or are not university or uh, school students weren't able to participate. And we were looking to expand this to a broader audience. And that is why we initiated uh, the Essential Medicines Project, which is an online project for reviewing and for gathering information on the availability and the costs of essential medicines. So I was talking before about the lack of information sharing. And so with this project, we wanna aggregate different sets of information that can be found in different places on the internet or people's knowledge and aggregate them all together to create one unified database where all this information is publicly available. And with that, we hope to break down the barriers both for the information and in the future for the access to essential medicines. And in addition to creating this database, which will be open for different members of the public, for policy, for research, for researchers, this will also inform our future activities in drug discovery in the lab-based project. So how do you participate in essential medicines? Well, we have a set of challenges uh, where we ask people to provide information about different essential medicines. And there are I don't have time, unfortunately, to describe each of every one of them and exactly how they work. But I will say we're asking people to provide information, either information from their own knowledge or things that they can find online or in different places about these medicines and their accessibility. So I will just talk about the last challenge, the circle of life, which is perhaps the more complex of the three challenges. Because some of these essential medicines have been around for over 50 years. So you can imagine that over this time, a lot of things have happened with these medicines, uh, like changes in prices, changes in ownerships, acquisitions. Uh, so we want to try and find out all these different life events that happen to these medicines in order to form a bigger picture and to get some meaningful insights into these medicines. So um, I'm going to show you an example for what we can do with all of this information. So this is the circle of life of a medicine called cycloserin, which is a medicine for the treatment of tuberculosis. Now, cycloserin has been around for quite a long time and it's had a lot of different events that happen. And while each event doesn't really tell us a lot, when you aggregate them together, you can actually tell a story of what happened to this um, drug over time and why. And most interestingly, and for this drug is what you would see in the bottom left in green. And that is a following an acquisition of the rights of this medicine. The price was hiked from $17 to $350, making it unaffordable 
for a lot of members of the public. Now, interestingly for Cyclosterin, this was actually intervened by a nonprofit organization that reacquired the rights for the drug and reduced the price again to an affordable price. So there's a happy ending here, uh, but unfortunately not all medicines have these um, happy endings. So by aggregating all this information, we weren't able to do this without you know, finding the little bits of pieces about this medicine from different places on the internet. Uh, we can actually understand um, which medicines are accessible to who, to what places in the world, um, and then work for the future um, to try and mitigate this and try and uh, make these medicines more accessible. Um, so I'd just like to thank you for listening today and thank all of my colleagues in the SCOPE group in the University of Sydney um, and happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Yala. You've now that I forgot to give you the warning system, but it just finished at 11 minutes and 50 seconds. So well done. There was a lot of chatter going on in the group chat. I'm just going to scroll back probably from the bottom upwards. But the first question for you, Yala, is are you working with people that are covered by Medicare with the second part of that being or international students and other migrants that are not covered, I guess, by uh, Medicare? Right. So I'm not sure if this was talking specifically about the students that are working in the lab-based projects. That's mostly um, focused on the synthesis. So it's not talking about their specific accessibility to medicines, but they're uh, working to help us in the project to synthesize these medicines and to find uh, new and innovative solutions. Uh, but more generally talking about the accessibility of medicines, that's definitely something that needs to be considered because some people have Medicare and some people do not. And there are different places in the world and different countries have different schemes uh, for um, medications and for their prices. So that is definitely something we're looking at and looking in different countries uh, and to see what the prices are um, and how these different price hikes affect different places and different people around the world. Thanks, Yana. Uh, Debbie, who asked the question, just elaborated a little bit more and what was more wanting to know about the accessible medicine projects in relation to Medicare and international students, I gather. Sorry? <clears throat> so uh, Debbie elaborated just a little bit and she wanted to know about more about the accessible medicine projects in relation to, I guess, Medicare, people covered by Medicare and international students. Yeah, right. yeah. So we're, so we're looking, yeah, both at the Medicare scheme, with Medicare, without Medicare, both in Australia and in other places in the world. Awesome. Thank you. There was a question from John. I am just scrolling back through it. Uh, he asked the question, would it be possible for the youth-based community groups to be involved with the Breaking Good project or elements of the project? Yes, definitely. We're looking to expand Breaking Good both in schools uh, and the essential medicines in schools. And we're, um, we would love co to collaborate with different people and with different youth organizations. Awesome. And I think Lindy just asked, we'll have one more question. Lindy just asked a question and I'm hoping it's related to your project was, <laughs> what does Wedge for Education represent? Sorry, Wedge for Education? It may I'm have, not sure. That's all right. It may have been relevant to something else. Oh, we, okay. I'm sorry. That, no, no, that's okay. Um, we may just hold off on any other questions. We do have a social networking session after which, which our presenters have been happy to hang around for. Uh, Yali, if you want to monitor, there may be some additional questions that come through, which you can answer directly via the chat, but we'll yes, have sure. them later on. I will now pass it over to Michelle, who will be our second presenter for this evening. Over to you, Michelle. Just on mute. There we go. Hi. Can everyone hear me okay? Yep. Yep, great. I'm just going to share my screen. Um, if I can get it up, there we go. Good evening, everybody, wherever you are uh, around the place. 
there we go. So um, thank you very much for allowing me to speak this evening at uh, this uh, great conference. Uh, and uh, I'd love to share with you some of our, about our, our project, uh, which is about OSMAP, which is the Australian Microplastic Assessment Project. Um, I'd just like to thank, um, as I said, the um, organisers for allowing me to come and, and likewise the traditional custodians um, of the lands which we are. I'm in Adelaide, so it's the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains. Our project is based through the Total Environment Centre, which is an organisation, non-for-profit organisation in Sydney, but I'm actually based in Adelaide just to throw a little spanner in the works. Um, it's the national program that we run here. So today I'm just going to talk to you about our program. So litter is obviously everywhere. We see it in our parklands, we see it in our waterways, we see it everywhere. And it's obviously a huge problem in which we're facing. Uh, so today I'd just like to talk to you about our innovative and program, our global first program, in fact, um, OSMAP, um, which is a national citizen science project for mapping microplastic around Australia. So the litter that we see, it comes from us. 80% um, of it uh, comes down our waterways, comes down our stormwater drains and lands into our oceans and other water bodies. This is a, a photograph taken in the Cooks River, uh, right here, well, in Sydney, and you can see an awful lot of debris. So 80%, as I said, comes from land-based sources. Once out there in the ocean, it often sinks and then suffocates anything else that's out there. So once out there, we know though that plastic does not break down. It only breaks up into smaller and smaller pieces, uh, creating what we call uh, is microplastics. And so microplastics are plastic pieces of debris that's less than 20 mils in size, millimetres in size. So about the size of half of your little pinky, uh, right down and it breaks up over time, over time, over time and creates even airborne plastics that, we, that we're actually breathing in. And I'll chat about that in a little while. For our program, OSMAP, we look at the one to five millimetre range because as a citizen science project, it's the stuff that we can see as citizens. So that's what we were using, that's that size class to be able to capture uh, that information on this. So where does this microplastic come from? Well, it comes from a variety of, of areas. Obviously there's the breakup of larger products. So a lot of probably about 45% or almost half of everything that's found out there in our environment uh, is made up from the beverage industry. Less so now with the cont container deposit scheme over here in Adelaide in particular, uh, still waiting for that in New South Wales, but it's the breakup of larger pl plastic items in our environment. Uh, there's also microfibers from the clothing that we wear, the synthetic clothing. Every time we wash our products, particularly active wear, um, those clothing fibers come off. And unfortunately, still now, uh, there's no filters in our washing machines that can capture that. And um, from wastewater, it goes straight out there into the environment. There's also over this side here on the right hand side of the screen is microbeads. So uh, in some of the products that we have that um, we cleanse our face with, we clean our teeth with, anything with a granule in it is actually made of plastic. Uh, and so obviously when we spit that out or we wash our phases, it washes straight down our uh, water system and straight out into the ocean. And of course then there's nurdles. So nurdles or resin pellets is the basis of, of all plastics. And so when plastics is made, it gets made into these round circular balls and then that gets molded into different products. And all of those create what we call microplastic. The impacts of these though are global, both on our, in, 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 in our entirety in the ecosystem. This is an albatross chick. Uh, so she or it hadn't fledged the nest at this point. And on the right there shows all the pieces of plastic that were actually found in that one bird's stomach, about 360 odd pieces. And you can see larger items such as whole toothbrushes or cigarette lighters that were actually found in there as well. So obviously uh, this bird died not only from probably a perforated stomach, uh, but also from um, the toxins that are attached to all of these plastics. And of course the belly fills up uh, with plastic 
and therefore the, the animal is not able to feed properly. If you can see down on the bottom part of the bird, um, you can see these little black marks down here. They're actually squid beaks, which is what this bird should have been fed and which it was being fed by its mum and dad. But obviously um, the belly was so full of plastic, unfortunately, um, that it couldn't feed on anything else. And unfortunately, as a result of all of this out there, there's that direct assimilation into the food, food web um, that then can potentially affect us as well. Um, and that's what our program's working towards. Uh, the human impacts, this looks like a very busy slide, but in fact, it's just highlighting the different projects that have started to look at the impact of plastics on the human health in our bodies. It can um, affect our respiratory system, our nervous system, a kidney system, et cetera, et cetera. So quite considerable, but in fact, you can't feed plastic to people. So we don't actually know that physical long-term uh, consequence of that as well. A recent study by our colleagues, I work very closely with Macquarie University in Sydney uh, and um, other colleagues from University of Newcastle have shown that through looking at people's diets and what they consume, that we as a general population consume around about one gram, uh, five, sorry, five to eight grams of microplastic every single week, which is equivalent to a credit card size which is kind of crazy. Now that can come in from uh, the water that we drink. If you drink a bottled water, not only is the bottle got microplastic attached to it that seeps into the water, but they even find it in the water, in beer, for goodness sake, uh, and many, many other places where they're finding plastics now. So this then led on to, there's all this plastic out there. Well, how can we, how can we look at the impact of this? And what better way than to engage citizens? And so, uh, OSMAP itself was um, initiated in mid to in 2018 uh, out of, as I said, the Total Environment Centre in Sydney. It's a nationwide citizen science project for mapping where this microplastic is around Australia. Uh, and really importantly, to educate, empower and engage our local citizens in, in exactly that. Because as scientists, we know we can't be everywhere. So by, by creating this innovative um, program by creating a, a rigorous scientific methodology, we're able to use that to map microplastic around Australia. So that's exactly what we do. So we identify using our OSMAP methodology where those hotspots potentially are. We identify then where there's no hotspots because that's just as important. Once we identify those spots, we look at the sizes of the microplastic, we look at the shapes, the colors, the types, very importantly, because then once we've identified that, we can then hopefully find out where they're actually coming from. Once we can find out where it's coming from, we can find effective remediation strategies to stop it before it enters our waterways. And in amongst all that, it's about behavioural change. By us doing this program with uh, lots of people around Australia, we're able to just change those people's perceptions on how they can make their own individual plastic footprint minimised. We also involved a lot of research and development in, aside from this, which is hopefully, and it is starting now, two years on to lead towards some management and some policy decision-making, which is really important. So overall around Australia since mid 2018, sorry, we've, we've undertaken 33 training events. So what we do is run these training events in different places around Australia, where we train citizens to be OSMAP leaders. We train them and we accredit them um, and they can be anything from teachers, environmental educators, school students, council staff, waste managers, um, and our best people that are involved are retirees. We then create these regional hubs around Australia and you can find out more information on that on our website. We've collected over 300 samples from around Australia. We've collaborated with over 350 different groups now, which is really exciting, trained over 560 people equating to around 35,000 volunteer hours of citizens, um, but most importantly, removed over 100,000 microplastics from our shorelines, which is really exciting. The more we can remove, the less impact they have, not only on us, but obviously on the animals that live there as well. So the program is basically cut into different stages. And, and the initial part of our program was about the development of the microplastics 
didactic sampling. And so uh, these are some figures here where we engage students and um, community members from around Australia using our methodology uh, and we collect that data, which we then map. Um, so if you're interested in getting involved, we've created these regional hubs um, and you can get in touch with them and be part of this program, anybody out there around Australia. So what we then find, this is an example around Sydney region, is that we've categorised depending on the microplastic per metre square as our microplastic load from very low zero to 10 right up to very high, which is a thousand and plus. So you can see a few black marks there around Sydney. Unfortunately though, being here in Adelaide, our actually highest loads that we found anywhere in Australia to date have been right here on West Lakes. Uh, if those that know um, Adelaide region, and I know Jasmine who's gonna speak soon is from Adelaide as well, over nine and a half thousand pieces per square metre we found in that area. So we're now working towards where is it coming from and how do we stop it? So over in DY, in, uh, for those that are in uh, Sydney would know this area, I've just moved over from there. We've got a program going around DY Lagoon where we're using our whole um, model to be able to engage a whole bunch of different sectors from um, Macquarie University, so students, um, non-for-profits like Surfrider, Coastal Environment Centre and Northern Beaches Council and local high schools and residents. And we've identified that the DY Lagoon is a hotspot. Very much so, it's also a, a very key ecological protected area for wildlife. The next stage is then to, to try and track where this stuff's coming from in which we're finding there. And that bottom right picture in the Petri dish, those little black marks, they're actually what we call rubber crumb. So this rubber crumb is like from soft fall, um, um, uh, play equipment areas and there's also you can see some grass like things that's art artificial grass from playing fields so we can start to track back and find out where these things are coming from once we know where they're coming from we can find those effective solutions to stop it and all in amongst that we can then target our education and awareness programs to those different sectors so for example um, being able to track where those sources are coming from this is a figure here of dy lagoon so DY Lagoon, it flows out into the ocean and back up through here is the creek system. And you can see it over here. And so what we can do is put some stormwater nets up along these different stormwater outlets. And we can try and identify which stormwater drain is leading to what kind of debris. So for example, in the industrial area up here, we have high loads of foam and also film, oh, sorry, foam and pellets up here mainly in the industrial area. Whereas in the high density area, which is down in here, a lot of film, a lot of plastic coverings. Uh, in the low density, normal kind of uh, dwellings, we have a high uh, load of hard plastic fragments as well as fibers and things like that. Whereas in the industrial area back up here is the only area that we find where the pellets are coming from, which makes sense because that's where the plastic's being made. So then we can come up with, okay, well, how are we going to stop it? Leading on to phase three. So in this stage, what we do is work with different uh, collaborators, uh, for example, Clean Water Group in, in Queensland, and we put in these drain buddies, which is basically a big trap in the, in the stormwater drain. So we can stop it before it even goes down the stormwater drain altogether. And then we can capture this material and we can actually start to identify what we're finding in there as well. And once we find out what kind of debris is coming from, then we can go to our stage four, which is all about the engagement and education. So we're working with local businesses and communities. And for example, this is a couple of photographs here of um, one of the schools in Sydney, where the boys there, that's at St Paul's um, Catholic School there, are using our program to be engaged and to look at different areas over time. We've also, as a part of this, because we're very much into education, we've designed whole um, um, curriculum-based programs for whole terms for much of the higher school um, uh, curriculum across Australia, which is really exciting. So where to from here? Well, we're about to come into our third year and it is all about engaging communities in citizen science. As I said, it's a global first program, uh, which is really great. And we're getting a lot of traction 
uh, start, we were starting in, in Asia before um, COVID hit, um, but our long-term goal is to establish OSMAP uh, as a globally recognised practical um, scientific program that can be used by citizens anywhere. Uh, so that's it from me. If you want to know any more, please drop me an email uh, or check us out on the website. Uh, and um, yeah, look forward to any questions. Thanks so much. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you very much for that talk. I'm still, I really shouldn't have put my wallet in front of me tonight because I still can't get over the fact that over the last month I've eaten all my credit cards. So that's, <laughs> that's great to know. Yeah. Uh, but important research nonetheless. Thank you. Um, I've got a question from Stephanie. Are there any uh, do-it-yourself ways we can prevent fibres being released from our washing machines? The best way is to uh, wash all of those synthetic clothes in um, washing bags because uh, it can contain most of it in that washing bag. And then all those lint pieces that are caught up in the bottom of the washing bags, then you can remove those. There are other balls called Cora balls, which you can get um, at some supermarkets and online, which sort of gather a lot of those microfibers once you put them in through the wash. So the, other than that, using wearing organic and cotton is the best thing. Awesome. Thanks for that response. I'm just going back through the chat. There's been a lot of positive feedback, brilliant work. Thank you. Uh, great to see this project, especially learning more about microplastics. I can't see, apologies if you have asked a question, but I can't see any additional questions. But as Michelle said, there's a lot more information on the OSMAP website. Um, and I hadn't heard about the hubs before. So checking out those hubs and what's near you is going to be a really great way to um, introduce yourself to it. And Michelle has Thanks, just- Thanks, Michelle. <laughs> If there's no other questions, and as I mentioned after Yala, during the social networking part, we will have more time for questions. I will pass it over to my co-host, Max, now to introduce Slido. Take it away, Max. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Okay, so what we're going to do now is uh, we're going to go to Slido, and we've got a couple of slides to speak all the way, and also uh, going to be announcing the winners of the uh, sequences for our later on. Um, so what we need to do, I'm just going to put on the, if you've not used Slido before, it's basically an interactive kind of live survey process. So it's a bit like when you have on social media and you have those polls of yes, no. And so I'm just going to put up the link now. So if you can go to slido.com and then you'll see it has an entry code. You just need to pop that code in and it'll take you to a website, which I'm just going to share the screen now. So you should be able to see this thing that's crossed. So this is a bit of a warm up before we have uh, two quiz questions. So I'll just give you a couple of minutes. There's also a QR code there if you want to um, and use that instead of putting into the hashtag. So if you can go to that, any problems, just pop them in the chat for me. If this all fails, then we'll just put the quiz questions in the chat and uh, get you to answer that one. So hopefully you're getting uh, onto the website. Anyone having any major headaches? So as a, I'll just give you another minute or so. Okay, just want to put my window right there. That's it, great, so we're up and running. So as you can see, this is a warm-up question. So why is citizen science innovative? And this is gonna give us um, a kind of word cloud of everyone that's on live when you can take part and we can then sort of see what we all think and hopefully it'll start building a word cloud and be able to tell us that whether it's, you know, we all sort of see it the same way or we see it very differently. So this is just a bit of a warm-up. So inclusive is great. Yeah, all scientists, yeah. They brace across the region. All right, I can put that into full screen. I think you can see that. So I'm just going to reshare so that we can see it correctly. Look at that, inclusive is coming in, very important. Different perspectives, pushing boundaries, I love that. Oh, patient voices online. So the bigger the words, the more that everyone's putting in the same word. And then obviously the smaller the ones, 
uh, it's one or two people. This is obviously all anonymous as well, so your name is not attached to any of this, don't worry. It's just a bit of fun to see if it works. We've got 16 counts. Public engagement, now that's taking over. So inclusivity and public engagement, kind of the same area, aren't they? I like all these as well, collective, collaborative, community. Upscaling, that's an interesting one. Learning, yep. Okay, so I'm hoping that then that has uh, worked. Obviously, we're all engaging, so that's great. Uh, there's lots of other words. Unique is coming in as well. Certainly, collaborative and inclusive is there. Okay, so now we know that that's working, I'm going to pause that one and I'm going to go to the next one. So this is the quiz for the prizes, and the first prize is the book. And I'm actually going to be getting you to, uh, hopefully uh, you've been paying attention because they're connected to the first two presentations that we've seen um, this evening. So hopefully you've all been um, screwed to the screen and paying attention. And this is the book that What is Life? Understanding Biology in Five Steps. So I'm just going to activate that quiz, and we should move on. So, starting the quiz. So, oh no, that's terrible. That's giving the answer away. <laughs> okay, so don't worry. I'm going to uh, stop that one. I'll come up with another one. Don't worry. Um, let's see, that's what happens when you don't trust it in advance. So, let me pause that. And this one, hopefully, will be the quiz. Okay, so now you should be able to answer, and it's how many microplastics have Osmat removed from our shoreline? It's going to be a fastest finger first. It's, people have been paying attention. So we'll have to go and see who is the fastest one. Let's see. Still creeping up, 90, 100. Okay, does it come to a stop? All right, so we will go back into the behind the scenes of this and find out who that is. That's one of the book. Uh, what is life and understand the biology in five steps? And I'll put that information, either I'll come back online or I will put that information into the chat so I don't want to break up the flow. Uh, and also keep an eye on the chat because um, the second question, which will be for the citizen science stamp pack. Um, will be on there as well, just so that we're, we're not kind of going back and forth. So hopefully that was a bit of fun. Apologies for the second one not working. I'll know for next time not to do that. All right, I'm going to now hand you back to Patrick. Thanks, Patrick. No worries. Thanks, Max. As you can see, it's always good to learn these things. And thank you, everyone, for participating in that. It's always good to uh, learn new systems. And if you haven't used Slido before, it's a really good interactive tool. So check it out when doing any community engagement. All right, so we're moving on to our final group of presenters. I'm going to pass it on to Jasmine now, who will take the lead. Um, all yours. Great. Thank you, Patrick. Well, it's been such a fantastic sit-side Oz, and um, tonight's a great example of that with Slido and with those um, the little word cloud. So thanks so much, Patrick, and to everybody else who behind the scenes has been making it such an awesome month. Hi, everyone. I'm Jasmine from University of Adelaide Environment Institute, but I'm also a citizen scientist for iNaturalist and for FungiMap. And I'd like to introduce you to the rest of our team for tonight. So two of South Australia's longest running and award-winning citizen scientists, Robert and Rosalie Lawrence, and one of our emerging scientists who's specialising in citizen science, Wendy Warren. 
Now together, as a community, we acknowledge and pay our respects to the Ghana people, which is where um, we're zooming in from. And they're the traditional custodians, of course, of ancestral lands of the Adelaide Plains. And we acknowledge your deep relationship to country and respect that past, present and ongoing connection to country and culture. And tonight in our session, we want to talk about culture in citizen science. And this central question around how might we harness citizen science for innovation? So note that subtle, it's not innovation in citizen science, but we're really interested in how can we harness citizen science for innovation more broadly? And we want to do this in four ways. We want to look at innovation and why does it matter in citizen science? some trends in citizen science innovation. And then we want to propose five principles. So this is a seed of an idea that we want to share with you and explore. So five principles, talking about that three, three case studies and then looking at what next. And this session, this little session is dedicated to the budding innovators amongst us. So those of us that have got some big ideas but aren't so quite sure about taking the next step. So innovation, why does it matter? Well, as we know, the UN's Global Biodiversity Report has warned us that we're hurtling towards mass extinction of a million species. So for us, this is the why of our citizen science. We need to find new ways to connect everyone with nature and we need to transform connection into protection. We need to discover innovative ways. And we believe that citizen science may be one of the most transformative. So we love hearing about the different types of um, citizen science that's being represented tonight. But for us, this is where our passion is. It's about protecting our planet. I'm gonna tell you about some different ways that we're doing that with citizen science. But we wanted to look around the world and see what are some of the innovations in citizen science around the world? So we did a little bit of a lit search. And this is what we found. And some key trends that were coming out of that, how that technology does continue to drive innovation. And we've heard some of that tonight already. And there's a bit of this shift beginning from describing patterns to testing interventions with citizen science. And this third one, that it turns out that in times of transition and change, like global pandemics, People sign up for citizen science. And it'd be great for us to find ways to continue that effort, of course. So what about in Australia? Well, we know that Alan Finkel proposed at an AXA conference, I think, was that two years ago? Three principles for citizen science, which we find really helpful. Solid science, powered by people to make the world better. And we believe that these three principles for citizen science are also really powerful for citizen science for innovation. We'd like to add two more, harnessing synergies and perseverance. And just a reminder that innovation can be those massive paradigm shifts, but it can also be the tinkering at the edges. So let's start with solid science. Let's start with thinking about problems. And we've heard some great examples of, of that happening through other projects tonight. So starting with the problem, really understanding that problem. We want to start with fungi map as our first case study. So the problem for fungi map, when fungi map started, was that we have an estimated 50,000 species of native fungi in Australia. They're weird and wonderful, all sorts of different shapes. They're important but they were in the too hard basket. Only 24% had been described. So the problem was how to teach people about fungi and how to get them to start to share records. So fungi map started. This is our innovation timeline. We haven't got time to go through it in detail, but I just wanna highlight that the yellow ones in particular are the ones where we've been able to partner or influence government. And one of the most, I guess, milestones, important milestones in our innovation journey has been going from people sending in photographs and Excel spreadsheets 
to find it that was really time consuming and we needed to find another way. So we spent probably about three years trying to work out how to resource an app. And eventually, thankfully, our naturalists caught up and we were able to make that transition. So you can see that in February, we made the transition. By December in the same year, we had 19,000 records in the FungiMap project. And what you can see here is we still have about the same number of records coming in every year, but it's shifted. So now that it is um, virtually entirely coming in through iNaturalist and that transition has happened, thankfully, very smoothly. And it really has transformed. So the second principle that we want to talk about is harnessing synergies or joining the dots, you can think about. And for that, I want to hand over to Robert and Rosalie. Thank you, Jasmine. So um, we have been involved with Wild Orchid Watch uh, right from the beginning because that's where we started. So back in 2012, um, we were chatting with people about improving orchid identification and we wanted a better way. We had a vague idea and it was really, we we're only talking about South Australian orchids. Um, then we came across uh, an identification in North America called Go Botany, looked good. And we had a software engineer who could help us, but it failed. So that caused us to just rethink what we're doing and we increased our vision. We weren't going to be just South Australia, we were going to expand it to the whole of the country. And it wasn't just about identification, we were going to make this the collection of quality research data because there is so much unknown about the orchids. So that's where we um, went to. Um, we then talked with lots of individuals, researchers, botanists, we discovered there was a need, people wanted it, but everybody was too busy. We even did a national survey and we had over 160 responses. So we knew we were on the right track. Then we run a grant in turn from the Adelaide University. And from that, we've developed an app and a website. So some lessons that we learned, people are important and you don't need to be the expert. I mean, we were novices when we started. We just wanted to learn about the orchids. We weren't researchers, we not in a government department or a university or anything like that. We've learned a lot, but we've also learned to keep in touch with novices because they will tell us the things that we've overlooked, sometimes the very obvious things. The second thing we learned was get involved and network. I mean, we talked to everyone, even if they weren't interested in the orchids, we still learned from them. We learned from other citizen science projects, such as Echidna CIS. We listened and the most frequent area of concern we heard was the security of orchid locations. So we made that a priority to address. Another lesson was flexibility. We allowed our ideas to evolve and to change. Our initial vision was small and didn't include the collecting of data. And Setbacks, well, we use them to refocus and refine our vision. Go Botany failed, so we thought about what we really wanted. We talked to UniSA IT staff and we just didn't communicate very well to them and so that didn't work out. But when we went to visit Ben Sparrow from Turn, we took with us a software engineer and boy, that made a difference. So we seized opportunities. When we first heard about the grant, my thought was, we're not ready. Roberts, let's give it a go. We had no backing, we had no university behind us or government department, but we gave it a go. And that grant was for half a million, that's why. So be adaptive was the other lesson. Back in 2012, iNaturalist was still in its early days, but partway through the grant, our team discovered that iNaturalist had concepts that we, needed but we also had things that we were wanting to develop that was on their wish list mm. and so it was a really natural collaboration to put the two together so where are we now well the plan had been to hold workshops across the country but of course COVID-19 everyone knows what happens so in September we had a minimalist launch we held four workshops in the Adelaide Hills 
because our launch was based around workshops. From that, we have 298 members, 127 active observers and over a thousand observations, and that's increasing daily. So even though COVID-19 did impact upon our launch and stopped us from doing the workshops across the country, we can still say we are where we are because we tapped into a need and networked with people. Thank you, Jasmine. Fantastic, thank you, Rosalie. So principle number three, and let me pause and say, the reason we're talking about principles is because for us, they're like guiding lights. So there's some times in citizen science where it's really hard to know what to do. I work with an endangered wattle called Wibbly Wattle. And we've looked at how to do citizen science. And at the moment, it's not the right time. And it's been reflecting on why is that? And for us, it was the principle of the strong science. It could be fun to have a citizen science for Wibbly Wattle, but the science question is not there to make it a priority at the moment. So that's why we're talking about principles because we find that they can be really helpful and we really hope that they can help others too if we think about them together. So our third principle, powered by people. So back to our fungi map case study. You can see here in our iNaturalist fungi map project, we are collecting a lot of records, but what's important here is the number of people that are engaging with it. So while we're getting similar number of what we call research grade, so really high quality records, about the same as what we were getting before, in the past there were two people identifying those records, now we've got a whole community involved in it, there's conversations, there's a whole lot more interaction, and on top of that, we're getting the same number of records coming in. So double the records, but with those new ones are new people getting involved, taking photos, finding out about fungi in ways that just wasn't happening before. And it's about the people powering that. But what's different is that there is much stronger feedback loop now, thanks to iNaturalist, than what there was before. And that that feedback loop is driving. It's the feedback loop that's powering people to put in more records. And the other thing is that for FungiMap, our biggest innovation may be what's happened this year thanks to COVID. We've gone from being based in the herbarium in Melbourne to now being a virtual NGO. So we are all around Australia and we meet by Zoom. And absolutely, as people said earlier in Slido, citizen science is innovative because it's inclusive. And that's why we've got four of us tonight because we wanted to demonstrate Zoom is fantastic. These online forums are so good. It makes it inclusive. We can have people all around Australia together, all around the world, all contributing in together. So that's why we wanted to do the four, because it's just a way that we can be much more inclusive than we used to be. And our fourth principle, perseverance. Over to you, Wendy. Thanks, Jasmine. Hey all, my name is Wendy Warren. I'm coordinating the project called iBandy. So in iBandy, our aim is to train citizen scientists to help them discover more habitat for the protection of bandicoots. iBandy is a local pop-up uh, pop citizen science project. We train people in this wonderful little app called iNaturalist, which helps people to identify and then document the natural world. We train people how to use this tool and then we encourage them to help us protect bandicoots by recording their observations of the world. For a project powered by people, the sudden loss of this face-to-face -face connection this year has posed some tremendous hurdles. As restrictions were becoming tighter and tighter, people were unable to do the very things that the success of this project depended on, you know, such as going outside and attending training sessions. So instead of throwing in the towel, we chose to explore some of the creative solutions um, to find uh, ways around these restrictions that were placed upon us. We had to face the reality and that was that this project just wasn't going to continue in the format that we had originally planned it to. And I can say it really didn't. Mm -hmm. So we found it to offer online training and we focused more effort towards an online presence. We worked within the confines COVID had set for the project and we were able to engage the community and build connection despite being apart. Um, we used breakout rooms where people were able to chit chat with one another and find common ground. We also used these breakout rooms to get people practicing using the app by finding living organisms around their house, such as pot plants or their own pets and sharing them um, through the app itself. 
Now, back in April, we believed that we were being really restricted by, um, but by looking back, we can now see that by persevering and by collaborating, uh, creatively collaborating, we've been able to practice innovation and expand to an online audience, which we might not have otherwise reached. We have now been able to train nearly three times the number of citizen science we had set out to train in the beginning. And the project's not over. We already have trained 85 new citizen scientists where we had originally only set out to train 30. Citizen scientists have collectively produced nearly 200 observations of bandicoots, bandicoots and their habitat. And we've gotten our message out to an audience of 385,000. So through sheer perseverance, iBandy has not, over managed, not only managed to overcome these hurdles and met our key goals, we have accomplished far more than we had set out to do. And these restrictions, you know, they, it turned out they weren't actually that restrictive at all. It forced us to consider new techniques and approaches that may have otherwise been completely overlooked. And our determination throughout this period allowed us to reach more people than we had even anticipated. So through perseverance in uncertain times, we've been able to engage even more like-minded people to join us in making a positive change for the world. Um, back to you, Jasmine. Thank you, Wendy. So our fifth principle, to make the world a better place. Hopefully you've been able to hear how through our four projects that we're involved in, we are helping to protect some of our most endangered species. So our key messages, just in summary, this question about how might we harness citizen science for innovation? We need to harness innovation to transform the protection of our planet, as well as all the other wonderful things about citizen science. And we, we really believe that citizen science can unlock transformative innovations. And we've talked about these five principles. So these are the ones that we, um, you know, that came to us as we were reflecting on it. But we're sure that you've got some as well. So hopefully there might be some in the chat. If there's not, we'd love to hear your thoughts on principles and we'd love to explore this further. So if you're interested in principles for citizen science for innovation, we'd love to hear from you. And just lastly, remember we talked about this little session that we were wanting it to be for budding innovators in citizen science. Now you might be seven, you might be 70. You might be brand new to citizen science, or you might have a lot of experience in citizen science and you're thinking, oh, I don't know, I'm not sure about that idea. Maybe that's going a bit too far, I don't know. We would say, do it. We'd love to hear your idea and um, we'd love to support you with it. So go for it. And thank you all. Thanks again um, to everyone behind the scenes for SITSI Oz. Thanks to our awesome partners, Australian government, state government and Trees for Life. Thank you all. And here's the contacts. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you. Back to you, Patrick. No worries. Thank you all for that fantastic presentation. There was a lot of questions coming in and I'm just monitoring the time because I know we are creeping over it, but we do have the session networking session as well. So looking at the questions, I'll go from the bottom and go up again. Just mind my squinting. Uh, Where's a shorter question? Um, so let's go up to the top, actually. So is technology the main lever for scaling up the impact of citizen science? And that one's from Stephanie. Is technology the main lever for scaling it up? Yeah, scaling up the impact. Oh, that's a great question. Um, I don't know if it's the main lever but yes absolutely and i you know i guess that's what we're wanting to demonstrate tonight and that's what covid has been it can definitely amplify it whether it's the main i'm not sure i yeah i'll keep thinking about that and stephanie i would love to hear your thoughts and and anyone else's as well rosalie or um wendy do either of you have any comments on that um i i see um the equipment we use are tools it's the people behind, the enthusiasm behind, the sense that they are getting, are being listened to, involved, that they have a part to play and that we are giving something back to them. So all of these projects that, you know, like with Fungi Map, I've used some of that as well. And 
uh, you give back that, well, yeah, I've learned something and now I can also help someone else. Mm -hmm. So I, it's the technology is but a tool. It's the enthusiasm of the people. I think it, I'd, I'd look at it differently. When things don't go well, we tend to upscale. And I've, that's come out with a couple of um, difficulties that people have had uh, tonight that um, when something doesn't work we, and we have to start again, we, we get a bigger picture of how we want to do it. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. And I, I think also the thing that we've reflected on here in South Australia is that there's a lot of crossover with the projects and particularly our three projects um, in ecology, the orchids need the small creatures, the bandicoots, but the orchids need the fungi. And um, it's seeing how we all work together. Mm, I agree. And I've just seen Michelle's um, comment in there and there was a comment earlier about inclusive and the powered by people and inclusive. I think that that's what, and I think that's what we're all saying. I think it's not technology that is um, the driver. I think you can have te technology and not have impact. I think if we want to have impact, it needs to be about people and connections and really authentic, deep, genuine connections. And I think that's what that's what has the power, and that's where, what will continue to grow things. I think that's a pretty solid response, um, and there's been some additional chat. I might just hold it at that one question, especially considering how good that final message was about citizen science and its ability to empower and enable. Uh, I think that's a pretty good closing message. I'm just going to share my screen again. Bear with me if I can find it. It's always fun. Hopefully that's coming through. So as part of tonight, we've had the six fantastic uh, talks uh, about citizen science and in, uh, innovation in citizen science, sorry. We have also been able to gather some additional resources for you and these will be made available on the AXA website. So the city of Kalamunda were able to provide us a video about native bees in the city of Kalamunda and we all know how important pollinators are. So if you're wanting a good introduction, definitely check that video. So that will be on the AXA website. And the Mozzie Monitors just recently created a new video which is Mozzie Monitors, the power of citizen science. So there's this project set up for mosquitoes and how it engages the, the community to be involved in their research. As I previously mentioned, you can go back and check out all the previous sessions that were on uh, throughout October. So disaster response and resilience. What does it mean to be resilient in connections and partnerships? So they're all on our AXA YouTube channel. I'd also like to just say a final thank you to our sponsors uh, for, for all their contributions right up into the lead up to SITSIOs online and throughout. And it's also, as it is the final one, I thought it was worthwhile thanking the working group behind, uh, who work behind the scenes, engaging with the presenters to create SITSIOs online in October. They spend a lot of volunteer hours putting it together. So thank you very much. I won't go through all of the names, but thank you uh, for all the efforts you put in. I do have some special mentions. So firstly to the, the team, so there was Amy, there was Emily, um, and there was Michelle, and no doubt there were others within that working group, but help put the comms material together. And it's sort of been a bit of a theme right throughout these presentations, how important communication is. And so they're able to put uh, not only the content, but interactive material together for e-newsletters, the website and social media. And that enabled the outreach to make sure that you online and others who joined previously were able to be aware of the event and join and learn from our fantastic speakers. And a final, final thank you. Uh, one person who's been sitting behind the scenes is Laura. She's been assisting us with Zoom, so making sure the working group knew what they were doing. Uh, when using Zoom, but also join every single night uh, to help if there have been any tech issues. So thank you very much, Laura, for all the time that you've put into supporting Sitsite Oz online. And a final thank you to our speakers for tonight. Again, I loved all of it. I only got to see parts of the slide leading into it, but hearing it, it was a really fantastic evening.